thank you, Tristan, for the uh, opportunity. And uh, I think it's a credit to you um, as a, a farmer group as such with uh, such a good turnout. Uh, thanks also to Troy Maitland and Airsy and Ed, who um, I think probably put my name forward as a, as a presenter today. I guess uh, t twofold, uh, I'll just start off with a bit of background. Um, obviously, FIFA Service Agronomist with YPAG, but um, I, I guess I identified a bit of a, a black hole on Northern York Peninsula for uh, trial work and research, and 11 years ago, uh, initiated a, a farmer group myself, uh, which is the NSS uh, group, and was chairperson of that for... Uh, seven years, I think it was, and executive officer for the same period, and uh, fortunately managed to hand pass that off a, a few years ago. And uh, yeah, we've now got a, a farmer who has been the chairperson ever since. The good thing there, and I think the analogy for you guys, is that the concentration was on, and particularly uh, subsoil constraints. So in, in that particular area, uh, you've got Port Broughton up here, Alford. Uh, I'm based at Kadena, just a little bit to the south. And uh, it may not show up that well, but it's a, it's a dune swale uh, soil system. A little bit of a closer up here, and you can just see the uh, sand hills uh, running through from a northwest, southeast direction. And uh, for, I guess, dunes obvious, sand hill swale uh, depression between the ridges, so the, the flats as we call it. So farmers and uh, agronomists alike were all guilty, I guess, of concentrating or focusing on uh, what's growing above the ground. Um, but I've got a particular passion uh, for what's, uh, well, what is below our feet, in other words, because uh, our soil is our, our livelihood. And uh, if we have a better understanding of what's happening you know, below the soil, then we can improve our, our crops uh, up above it. And just as, as some examples, like there's three, um, yeah, for the thousands of cores that I've taken over the years, I always take a photo of it because even within a paddock, as you guys know, stating the obvious, you've got many, many soil types uh, within a paddock. So having a really good reference base of uh, all the profiles, um, you can just see that this is within one paddock, three different sand hills, three different soil types, and uh, the same for the different flats. Uh, and that's not only physical constraints, but it's nutritional and, and just water holding capacity as well. So uh, I guess the whole industry, we're looking at uh, efficiencies. And uh, I, I sort of look that water use efficiency uh, is fine, but we're now looking at uh, other things like nutrient use efficiency. And uh, that, that particularly uh, becomes important in, in my neck of the woods and even with a few of you in the room that I, I caught up with yesterday afternoon. Um, we just saw how a, a crop like lentils can uh, really uh, have a, a different growth habit, I guess, or restrictions with different soil types underneath. And uh, in some of those patches we looked at, as soon as we dug into the ground, we identified the constraint straight away underneath. So it was nothing up above, it was, it was what was happening below the ground. So from a, a YP perspective, uh, land values and, and leasing are, are going through the roof and for a lot of people it's, it's just become unaffordable uh, to expand or, or to uh, buy or lease. So what we're trying to do is actually make um, uh, things like sand hills more, more productive. So identifying those constraints and, and doing something about it uh, within their own farm, thereby producing more off that same uh, land mass. So literally, how, how do we turn these red sand hills on this yield map here, uh, looking more like the green flats? And in, in a case like this, it, it might be a four or five tonne crop in the flats, and it's back to one or two on the hills. So how can we, we level that uh, back up? I came across this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was uh, quite interesting, like a uh, hundred odd years ago. And I, I'll put my hand up, I actually had to go and Google the conversion of a bushel. Um, so to put that in kilos per hectare, 100 years ago, the state average was 12.4 bushels or 800 odd kilos a hectare of grain. Um, and in our area here, uh, it was actually a little bit higher, one tonne. 
It's just yeah. unfortunate that immediately around Karina this year, like some of my crops are only going to grow about one tonne. Uh, it's, it's quite poor in that, that localised Karina area. But uh, there are, are better areas um, yeah, further, further north and uh, the south is catching up now as well with, with some rain. So we've come a long way in, in that 100 years um, with, with the farm averages. An interesting thing here, April to November rain was 13 and a half inches and we've probably had about, uh, I'd say about a third of that. Um, so it does show, yes, we can talk water use, but uh, machinery, uh, efficiencies, uh, agronomy, varieties, farm management as such, we've just improved so much uh, over that period. So what I wanted to have a... Uh, I guess the presentation to you guys is, is just how we've looked at strategic tillage. Um, and I don't think I'm going to focus on nutrition as much as the actual tillage because I believe that if you overcome those soil constraints with whatever form of tillage that uh, you're looking at, that the nutrition benefits will flow on from that. So um, just a guide, and I'll just touch on nutrition briefly here, but... Um, we're lucky that we've got uh, some batteries or, or a lot of uh, chook places just up the road. So chicken litter uh, is, well, red, I'll say readily available, even though it's completely scunned for next year already. So some of my clients are having trouble actually getting their, their hands on it. But just something like that uh, has played a major role um, in turning the, that non-productive uh, ground historically into quite productive uh, land and I think it sort of shows up, uh, here's an early one here, basically halfway down the, uh, the photo here you've got your, your chicken litter applied on a sand hill to the left, this is a little bit later on and it, it definitely starts standing out here, better crop here than to the right and on, on the yield map, if you can see because we only, only did three passes, that green strip there was about five tonne. As soon as he got off the, uh, the hill or the, the chicken litter, it was back to uh, about half of that. So it was, a, it was about 2.3 2 tonne difference between that green strip where the chicken litter went uh, and the red strip uh, either side. So it, it definitely has, uh, has helped. And uh, a bit like Nigel said, when you're incorporating nutrition as well as overcoming those subsoil constraints, then you know things can improve uh, even further. So things like deep ripping, um, spading, delving, and uh, to a lesser extent for us, moldboard uh, ploughing, uh, we're really helping to maximise our returns um, by improving that soil. So in some aspects, you can throw a lot of inputs into those soils and just not have that return. But as soon as you overcome that restraint, then your return on investment is, is just what's well, quite phenomenal. And um, yeah, that's what we're really looking at, particularly, as I said, with land values as they are on your peninsula. Uh, you've got to make every, every dollar count. So... Uh, yeah, just a, a Vardastead uh, deep ripper here and you can see the spader in the background. Um, we've had a, had a look at, uh, well, all, all sorts of strategies and um, I'm not going to stand here and say this is best or, or this is worse because uh, across all your different soil types on your farms, each strategy might be different uh, for each one of you. Uh, and that's, that's probably the, the key take-home message is that there, there isn't something that will suit, suit everyone. Uh, and that's probably where I'm alluding to here, that it's important that you actually identify the constraint first um, because if you think you've got a problem and you go and do something about it, then you can actually bring on uh, other problems in that particular soil type uh, or make existing issues worse. And uh, examples of that of where we've moldboard ploughed um, just with some NSS work uh, this year, we've brought on um, some manganese deficiency and spading. And it's probably not, not a good practice to spade and then sow lentils, but um, you can see on the right-hand side what the lentils look like after, after spading. So we've had erosion initially uh, with the lack of rainfall and some severe winds this year, 
Uh, and then we've had chemical damage as well uh, with a, a, an uneven sowing depth. Uh, and as you can appreciate, being farmers, like with a very low level of um, stubble and, and biomass on the right there, that's going to have implications over summer, like going forward uh, before the wheat crops sown. So uh, I probably can't um, reinforce that particular point uh, enough that you really want to know what's going on under your soil before you go and do something about it. I just uh, grabbed a little bit of data here from, uh, from Port Broughton and um, it's probably applicable to the West Coast as well. So the, the orange line um, was 2015, two years ago. And if you, in cricket terms, if you follow that worm across, um, we had a good start. We had uh, above average rain in April. And then as the year progressed, we got out to August. That was a bit of a saviour. Um, you know, it almost put us back up to average rainfall, which is decile 5, that, that green one. And uh, then I called it the blowtorch, came across us in late September and October and finished crops off quite, quite quickly. And we ended up with partway between decile 1 and decile 3, so call it decile 2 um, growing season for the year. What we actually found was that we had huge responses to different forms of strategic tillage in that particular year, and that was predominantly um, better access to moisture um, because of the or lack of rain, the heat, the winds, uh, just the moisture stress that was placed on the crops uh, during that, that grain fill period out here. The interesting thing though, uh, 2016 came along, which is the red line, and uh, I don't know what decile you want to put that into, here's decile 9, and Port Broughton had 100 mils more than decile 9, so literally it was one of the wettest years, and, and for a town just up the road called Butte, it was the wettest year uh, on record for them. So um, yeah, very, very wet. Started dry in, Octo uh, sorry, in April and just progressively got, got wetter. And there was a couple of months, I think it was uh, June and September, that we had 100 plus mils for those months. So moisture obviously wasn't limiting that year, but we still had a response to strategic tillage. So that, that's got my, my brain ticking as to what, what's actually happening then. And um, as I've put there in a, in a comment, I think you, we're starting to see benefits from um, nutrient uh, availability as well. So two completely contrasting years, as you can see, with the red and orange uh, lines, and they've gone in different directions, but we've had a response both years. Um, and one was a, a absolute cracking uh, finish, cool, mild and wet, and the other was the complete opposite. So um, it does... I guess, give you some confidence that, um, you know, regardless of the year, you can have benefits from looking at um, different tillage uh, techniques. Um, yeah, no surprises. There's a huge array of uh, reasons for looking at strategic tillage. And, you know, some of them might be as, a, as simple as a physical constraint, like a hard pan or what we call... Um, sort of clay seams, which is only a very thin layer of, of compacted clay uh, particles. Non-wetting sands, uh, as Chris mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, incorporating stubble, other nutritional products, ameliorants, to name a few. Uh, and this is something here that uh, came across. Um, I was just digging up lentils, looking for nodulation, and could barely put the shovel in, like there was just a real hard pan, and that was a nice clay loam soil, but uh, it was severely compacted at uh, about 10 centimetres down. And this is a bit of work that Airsy and Ed uh, did, uh, and it just shows you the pockets of, of non-wetting uh, sand in a, in a particular soil type around Port Broughton. So this is something that's just my own, own opinions, own, own reference, but there's all sorts of different things that... Um, and I've called them objectives. So once you've identified a particular constraint, um, yeah, then you can set about to, to fix it. But things like hard pans and compactions, well, if, if we fix them, we're increasing our moisture and our nutrient availability, literally so that roots can have access to the soil at depth um, for both reasons. Non-wetting sands, similar type of thing, uh, bringing that clay up, whether it be clay spreading or, or delving, 
Um, initially, it's better water penetration, so you're wetting up that, that uh, seed zone and getting better establishment. Uh, and then that has the, the flow-on effects uh, from then. Just as a show of hands, uh, does anyone have freshwater soaks over here at the bottom of sand hills? Or yeah, it's becoming a, a major problem over home, and I've actually said that we're conserving moisture too well uh, now. So um, no-till, spraying summer weeds, for instance, um, in our June swale system, we're just having a lot of a lot of moisture, and it's not only vertical; it's also lateral through the soil. And uh, the, the bottom of the sand hills, and you'll, I'll show some photos shortly, but we're having areas that uh, I've jokingly said guys could put a whole heap of ducks on and reeds and literally you know, go duck shooting if they wanted. They're just becoming highly unproductive. So strategic tillage is, is helping us uh, alleviate those problems uh, as well. So here, it's, it's not more moisture. It's actually that we're using more moisture and therefore having less of a moisture problem. So it's, it's actually the opposite way of looking at it. So better utilisation of, of both of them at depth and we're, we're growing better crops up above them, which is using more moisture and thereby drying those soaks up. Salinity management. Show of hands again. Who's got any transient salinity or saline magnesia problems? few of it, yep. So in this case, uh, the tillage is, is giving us more moisture available to the seed, so the, the salt isn't out-competing the, the seed early. Better germination, establishment. Once you've got that crop established there, and, and you would have seen it on, on wet starts the years, you actually get that, that magnesia uh, saline errors to actually establish, but tillage can play a part there. Incorporating ameliorants uh, is, is obvious and incorporating nutrients, which is more so a, a nutrient factor. Improving the cation exchange, uh, which is the ability of your soil to retain nutrients and hold water. Uh, less water logging, so for those further down uh, AP in the, in the higher rainfall areas, like the, the tillage is actually allowing um, you know, that, that higher rainfall area, I guess, instead of the water just sitting there, it's allowing it to get through and, and out and, and help with water logging. And I, I want to do a bit more research on it, but I've, I've just seen time and time again, and it's probably very applicable for the past week for the whole of, uh, well, SA and, and even Victoria, but um, where we've done strategic tillage, we've actually got better frost tolerance. And I'm just, just wondering if it's better, better nutrient availability, making a healthier plant, thereby um, yeah, being able to tolerate that, that frost a bit better. So question mark on that one. Uh, it's not something I'll promote outly, but I'm just suspicious that we're having flow-on benefits from that uh, as well. So uh, before I get into a bit more detail, just a, a, a summary on that part, like we're having better establishment better root penetration, greater access to moisture and nutrients, hence larger root systems, healthier plants, more tolerance to stress, higher yields. So it's just a, a flow-on effect right the way through. Um, but there's, there's one thing to consider, and it's particularly uh, ramming home on those sand hills, is that we are pushing our yields higher and higher and higher. So moisture's not the limiting factor anymore, and, and we're actually... Um, inducing all sorts of nutrient deficiencies because uh, we haven't actually treated those sand hills and the like um, you know, as well as what we should. So now that we've freed up the moisture aspect, the nutrients are the, the limiting factor. So it's just an interesting one. You've probably heard of Liebig's Law, which just says whichever is the limiting factor, you can throw everything else at it, but that one factor until that is actually fixed, like that, that will be the, the limiting factor. So... Strategic tillage can uh, alleviate that moisture stress or uh, give you better access to moisture, but then all of a sudden you have to look at some of your nutrients as well. So just to look at, um, and apologies if it's uh, going over ground that you've gone over before, but just three or four of the main strategic tillage uh, aims, I guess I'll call it. So deep ripping and... For anyone that's uh, had a workshop with or a soil pit day with Airsy and Ed's, um, I can always tell 
who's been with you guys, because they'll use the term fracturing rather than deep ripping. So uh, hence I'll put that up there as well. And it's, it's probably one of the, the other things that I've learnt is um, deep ripping or fracturing doesn't have to be this deep. In some instances, like you, you'll find that the problem is only a little bit under. Uh, occasionally it's been five centimetres, more probably 12 to 15 down at that, that seedbed, um, or sorry, topsoil uh, depth. And um, yeah, there are instances still that you, you do have to look at that deep sort of even 30 to 50 centimetre uh, tillage. But particularly with fracturing, we're looking at salinity management, shattering that hard pan or the compaction layer. It has really helped with um, soak management over home. And uh, as I touched on before, um, better soakage in the high rainfall areas and uh, some frost um, management or better frost tolerance as well. So to, to put that in uh, photo form, hopefully these come out uh, okay. Um, you can see what I'm talking about in this particular soil type. It was only roughly five centimetres down that we came across. And it, and it wasn't very deep, but it just a real compacted uh, sandy loam um, uh, layer, I'll call it. Uh, as he's put his, his knife in there, and you can just see how instead of cracking uh, vertically, it's just cracked horizontally. So there's... There's a real difference in um, uh, the, the penetration or the, the hardness of the, the soil there. The clay seams that I was talking about are these lines going through here. And um, quite often when the, the, the dye gets put through uh, the, the soil, it'll actually hit those seams and, and move laterally. And that, that has actually been adding to our woes with the, the soak management. The water's been hitting them and, and going... I guess in the shallow topsoil rather than what we initially thought in hitting the clay at depth and then running out. So it's, it's definitely having an effect there. So in that sense, it might only be 10 or 20 centimetres down. Um, there's our identified constraint, and that, that's what we're trying to shatter or, or fracture there. Uh, and this one, they always say a picture tells a, a thousand words. Well, you may be thinking that it was actually sown, well, up and down the photo, but... That, that's the deep rip or fracture marks. Um, the crop, particularly if you can see the lines down here, is actually sown across the page uh, in a transient salinity area. And um, the crop has established really well. Uh, it's barley in that instance where the, uh, the deep rip or fracture lines are. And despite the fact that it's been sown at right angles, um, yeah, in between those, those fracture lines, uh, there's, there's literally no, no establishment. So that, that was a real win in that case, and the client went back the next year in between those um, deep rip marks and, and fractured in between. Uh, once again, the old uh, rabbit ripper, um, and you can see one going across diagonally there as well. Um, the reason why I've put a DBS up there is it just that uh, I guess I'll... Um, say that it doesn't have to be a separate pass. If you've identified that your problem's only here or maybe here, then something like a, um, a DBS or a conserver pack or any of those parallel, uh, parallelogram setups that have the ability to disturb under your seedbed, like you can actually put that down and during your seeding pass you can actually do that fracturing uh, pass if you've identified where the problem is there. Uh, an old yeoman's plough um, that a client's mo modified with um, your deep rip points. And uh, you, you will see it is the York Peninsula, so there's a lot of photos of lentils. Um, but they are highly responsive to strategic tillage. And uh, you can just see again the, uh, the deep rip marks going, going across this sand hill here. Nice and green, extra, extra nutrients, extra moisture. Uh, everywhere in between, it's, it's hayed off al already. So um, uh, no surprises when you're talking a high-value crop uh, like that. If you're getting only small responses, they're still worth a lot. But particularly with strategic uh, tillage and lentils, we're getting massive responses, which is meaning you know, really big dollars uh, per hectare. How are we going for time? Five? Okay. I, I will skip through a few and probably concentrate on the photos more than anything. 
delving. Aim of delving is to bring up your clay to the, the surface for things like non-wetting sands and to improve like your cation exchange uh, for nutrient retention and, and water. So it hasn't been as much of this done on northern York, but quite a bit on southern York where we've got a lot, a lot more non-wetting sands down in that um, Stansbury, Middleton uh, area. And um, all we're trying to do there in the, the non-wetting areas, which most of you may have seen paddocks or areas in paddocks like this, is bring that clay up and uh, just in, improve the, um, the water wet up, I'll call it, of, uh, of the topsoil. Spading's probably been one of the most popular methods uh, of strategic tillage on the, on the peninsula, um, and that has a whole range of, of benefits, um, you know, starting with hard pans and compaction, but incorporating your, your stubble, uh, other nutrients, lime on uh, acid soils, gypsum. Uh, but it does have its own downfalls, and particularly in the first year, we found that the, um, the cedar bars were actually sinking a lot more, therefore sowing depth was compromised, and... Uh, in a lot of our trials, the first year of spading was actually one of the worst treatments, but the following years after that, it, it just went through the roof. And, uh, yeah, one in action here, but you can just see the difference between non-spaded and spaded. And as I said, with lentils, uh, no surprise where the spader has actually gone in that, that particular photo. And interestingly, I, I've got a an inkling that it's actually buried a lot of weed seeds there as well. Uh, there's far less weeds in the spading strip here. Um, and I do have the yield map later on, but that was 1.2 tonne lentils extra, which last year, I think it was 650 bucks a tonne as an average. So you do the sums there, and just that one pass has been... And, and I'll just, um, just put you in the picture that that was done two years ago. So uh, that was done in the, before the barley... Uh, in the barley, it was the worst strip. In the lentils, they've really responded once that soil has sort of settled down a lot better. Uh, plus and minuses, you can see where the spader's gone there. And, and with the spader, um, for anyone that's interested, if, if you do manage to do a, a deep rip uh, or even a, a delving beforehand, so that's what's happened over here. Then the spade has come across. It actually does save a lot of time uh, and diesel and effort because the spade doesn't have to work as hard when it actually uh, goes through. So doing that initial pass, um, that just means there's more hectares done because um, it's charged per hour normally and therefore it's a lower cost per hectare to the farmer. So mobile ploughing, I uh, probably won't touch on too much, but it's just interesting that some of the, the photos that you put up, Chris, um, you can actually see that, that swirl. It's almost identical to the, the photo that, that uh, you put up, that swirl in here and also in here. Uh, and then there's one in action over, over home. So, uh, yeah, there is a, a little video at the end, but I think for time I'll, I'll let that go, Tristan, but... Take-home messages, um, ground truth your area so you actually know what the problem is for a start and that might be doing soil pits or, or just digging your own pit as such and, and soil testing the different layers. Determine the, the target problem and then actually set objectives of what you want to achieve with your strategic tillage. And I say to all my clients, go and have a crack, like whether it is half a paddock or just a couple of strips, make sure it's big enough that you can actually, uh, if, you've, if you're into yield mapping that, that you can actually yield map the difference because that's what you want to uh, prove to yourself is what your return on investment or what the improvement actually is. Uh, it doesn't show up too well in that photo, but um, that particular client did all his tillage passes at about a 15 degree angle so that he could actually tell um, what was a, a strategic tillage response because everything else, whether it be chicken litter or seeding, spraying, was all done up and down the paddock. And, um, yeah, that, that little yule map just here, you know, you can see the, the green strips here, which is the spading versus the untreated. Uh, so we're just having green lines and red lines go up and down the paddock where he'd actually done his, his tillage. So best trials and demos done in your own backyard and that's probably the other thing is not, not every soil is going to be responsive because the, the spader in that instance was going up and down the whole paddock. But we did have patches, uh, if I can look here somewhere, 
down the bottom here where we were, it was only orange or maybe uh, yellow, yellowy orange through there. So we weren't, in some soil types, we weren't getting that response. So it, it doesn't happen across the whole lot. Um, but, yeah, the, the responses were really good um, from that, that particular one. So thanks, Tristan. Hopefully I didn't go over time, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is uh, a couple of years ago now. Here's the, the line down here. It, it literally looked like it, it hadn't been affected at all, whereas uh, in lentils, like you can just see that, that typical bleaching and um, the leaves just freeze, the cells burst, and they, they grow a yellowy bleach look. But, yeah, I, I'm not sure if uh, I should be looking at tissue testing or, or what it was, just that, that visual observation that we could pick up like where, in this case, it was actually deep ripping or fracturing, where, where the pass had gone through the paddock. Um, so, yeah, my theory is that the, the lentils have just got better access to, and it, look, it could be things like um, copper and potassium, perhaps, that I'm um, suspicious those sorts of things help with uh, water regulation, and potassium in particular is um, responsible for... Um, what would you say, buffering against some, some form of stress. Um, so, I mean, Nigel's here in the room, like he, he might be able to elaborate a bit more later on, but I don't have the actual answer. It's just when you look at it and you see chalk and cheese, you say, well, I know which one I'd rather have. <laughs> 